Sheryl Sandberg, the legendary COO in charge of Meta. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. Mitt Romney, US presidential candidate. And John Legend, the Grammy Award winning musician. They all have one particular thing in common that they share with other extremely successful people. They all work for one of these three consulting firms, the MBB. Traditionally, being part of the MBB meant being part of an elite group of a little bit like surgeons or lawyers. So for years, they have been the feeding pipeline for ambitious people looking to make millions. The perfect first job that symbolizes prestige, status and success. But through a lot of scandals in recent years, their reputation has taken a major hit. More than 130 people in the U.S. die each day after overdosing on opioids. Opioid, 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 opioid. The opioid crisis. Behind the glittery facade of MBB, there is a darker side. Scandal after scandal has defined the industry in these past years. But how exactly does their business model work? Are the MBB responsible for the US brain drain, recruiting the world's brightest minds to work on pointless PowerPoint presentations instead of actual innovations for society? Could it be that the renowned MBB, famous for assisting the moon landing and consulting UNICEF, are actually creating more damage than value in the world? Before we dive into today's video, now I'm blessed with my hair genetics, but I also wanted to stay that way. At the same time, I wanted a solution that's convenient and effective because I need to travel a lot for my business. That's when I discovered Keeps. Their treatments are not only affordable, but also 90% effective according to clinical studies. Keeps is an online subscription service that brings clinically proven treatments for hair loss right to your doorstep. They provide personalized treatment plans tailored to your unique needs, all recommended by licensed medical providers. Plus, the flexibility of choosing delivery options means you're in control of your hair care journey. Keeps offers both FDA-approved hair loss treatment options as well as a 2-in-1 gel for that extra boost from hair thickening shampoo to conditioner and styling pomade they got you covered. They have helped nearly 1 million men keep their hair with over 4,500 five-star reviews. Treatments are delivered discreetly to your door. Now, if you're ready to take the next step in your hair care journey, hair loss stops with Keeps. And I've got a special offer for you. Head to keeps.com slash megalomedia or click the link in the description to get started. Remember, Keeps is not just about hair, it's about confidence. Click the link in the description and get started. Today McKinsey, BCG and Bain collectively employ more than 80,000 people in more than 250 offices across the globe, achieving tens of billions in revenue and making their owners millions in profit every single day. Thousands of supposedly ambitious young grads prefer to work for a company that someone else started instead of building their own legacy. But this phenomenon this industry, it all started with one person. So how do you invent a 900 billion US dollar industry from scratch? Enter Arthur D. Little, initially a man of science and innovation. He lays the foundation for an industry that will reshape global business strategies and even political decision making. Arthur Dihon Little is not just any chemist, he is a visionary who sees the enormous potential of applying scientific principles to solve the most complex business problems. After graduating from MIT, Little co-founds his soon-to-be large consulting company. Guys, who wrote this script? Give this man a raise. Anyways. He co-founds his soon-to-be large consulting company Arthur D. Little Inc. in 1886. The city of the founding? Boston, his hometown and the scientific capital of the United States. Then already one of the biggest cities in America, Boston would continue to be crucial for the development of the consulting industry. 
Even to this day, the city's brightest minds don't go into research or build innovative companies. They join one of the infamous consulting firms after graduating with honors MIT or Harvard. And that's a massive problem for society, as we will find out. In its first years, Little's company isn't a management consulting firm, but focuses on technical and laboratory services. However, Little's approach is different. Through his quickly growing industry knowledge, he's able to see unique opportunities that his clients missed. He is able to predict market trends and technological advancements ahead of time and knows more about the market his customers operate in than themselves. And if you also want to know more about business and finance than any of your normie peers, you should subscribe and leave some comments. How about this smooth segue? A belief that shapes the way ADL runs their consulting practice to this day. Other people's troubles are our business. A philosophy that in 1907 will become the first guiding slogan of what will later be an entire industry. But how does a company that initially focuses on providing technical and laboratory services evolve into a management consulting giant that will jumpstart one of the most influential industries today? It all starts with one specific contract. In 1911, Arthur D. Little Inc. organizes the creation of the first R&D lab for the industrial giant General Motors. With this project, Little basically invents contracted professional services. This is a turning point for ADL as it marks the birth of a whole new business model. It is pioneering the way his firm makes money. Essentially, this is the birth hour of management consulting. By 1935, when Little passes away, he has not only founded the largest unendowed commercial industrial research laboratory in the US, he has also planted the seeds for what will become a global consulting powerhouse. His legacy is a new breed of consulting, one that combines scientific analysis with business acumen, reshaping how organizations tackle their most complex problems. There is one little known thing that the most successful entrepreneurs and megalomaniacs share. They aren't the first to offer a product or service. They are the first to do it well. One consultancy follows this credo and, after only a few years, dominates an entire industry. Usually when you hear the McKinsey consultants are coming to see you, it sends a shudder through most organizations. Influencing global economies, space programs, the occasional drug epidemic, international politics and even wars between nations. But how does this come to be? It all starts with the teacher, James Oscar McKinsey. A University of Chicago professor creates the firm that revolutionizes management consulting. His company will shape world-leading organizations and create questionable value for decades to come. McKinsey's vision is simple yet profound, using technical accounting principles as a tool for management. This innovative approach lays the foundation for McKinsey & Company in Chicago, initially an accounting and management firm. James' unique perspective on business efficiency comes from his well of experience with military suppliers. During his tenure at the United States Army Ordnance Department, he witnesses horrendous inefficiencies on a daily basis. Since the military is financed by taxpayers' money, McKinsey gets to work and starts to optimize. His ethos and practices are further defined by Marvin Bower, who joins the firm early on. To this day, he is regarded as one of the most influential people in the history of consulting, next to Kevin John. Bauer, a Harvard-educated lawyer with a strong economics background, introduces principles and values that form the bedrock of McKinsey's famous company culture. For example, the up or out policy. Thanks to Bauer's efforts to increase efficiency, every year the 15% of consultants who perform the lowest are asked to leave the company. 
this practice takes place even today, and it remains the main source for insane pressure and long working hours of strategy consultants worldwide. When I used to work in consulting, we often started work at the client site at 9 a.m. And then we worked until 11 p.m. or midnight. That was normal. The less pleasant projects were when we regularly finished around 2 or 3 a.m. And then you need to get back to the hotel. Due to a powerful shared vision, the 1940s and 1950s mark an era of expansion for McKinsey. This is especially true for Europe. The firm and its client base grow rapidly. Young and mildly naive consultants are suddenly everywhere, advising CEOs across the globe. By now, the project range expands among governments, defense contractors and blue chip companies. By 1966, McKinsey establishes its presence in key global cities, including London, Paris and Amsterdam. This period also sees the firm shift from being an accounting-focused entity to the category-defining management consulting juggernaut. But the road to dominance does not come without challenges. The entry of competitors like the Boston Consulting Group, as well as Bain and Company in the late 1960s and early 1970s intensifies the competition. These new rivals introduce branded products and specialized niche industry expertise. They are posing a significant threat to McKinsey's generalist stance. If they want to stay on top, McKinsey needs to innovate. Responding to the competitive pressure, McKinsey, under the leadership of Ron Daniel, begins to shift its strategy. The firm develops specialized working groups and focuses on building expertise in strategy operations and organization. This period also marks the beginning of McKinsey's efforts in knowledge management, a pivotal move that would cement McKinsey's supremacy. This goes back to the central dilemma. As a consultant, how do you consult a client that has been in the industry for decades? The only way this is possible is by specializing. For example, I did a lot of projects in the CGR, so consumer goods and retail, and the M&A space. And it allowed me to share my experiences from one project with a client on the second project after that. Entering the 1990s, McKinsey finds itself at the heart of the digital revolution. The firm sets up accelerators to support internet startups, reflecting a strategic shift towards technology and e-commerce. Despite the dot-com bubble and the subsequent economic downturn, McKinsey's agility and strategic foresight allow it to keep growing, and they grow immensely. The turn of the millennium sees McKinsey expand its focus on the public and social sectors. They take on numerous pro bono clients and invest significantly in knowledge management. Pro bono publico is a Latin phrase that means for the common good of the public. And pro bono consulting is helping individuals or mostly organizations for free or nearly free. Why? Could be intrinsic motivation, could be virtue signaling. This period also demonstrates the firm's increased emphasis on understanding specific markets more profoundly, which leads to the founding of McKinsey's industry groups. Specialized units within the firm that are focusing on consulting specific industries. Now, this structure is considered a blueprint for most consultancies worldwide. Today, McKinsey stands as the global leader in consulting. It's one of the largest and most influential consulting firms in the world. The firm boasts over 30,000 employees across 130 cities and generates tens of billions in revenue. Its reach into areas like digital transformation and sustainability tries to convey a forward-looking ethos. Recent initiatives in carbon dioxide removal and green tech acquisitions make McKinsey seem like the good guys in this story. Yet, McKinsey's path has been dotted with controversies. Scandals involving insider trading, fraud and bribery have taken their toll on McKinsey's reputation. And McKinsey isn't the only one. 
They are just the biggest of dozens of firms that influence the decisions of world leaders. Oliver Wyman, Monitor Deloitte, Roland Berger, A.T. Carney. As we look at McKinsey's two biggest rivals, Boston Consulting Group and Bain & Company, let's examine the true nature of these firms. And we'll start with a friendly little tournament that turns into a betrayal and subsequently leads to one of the biggest feuds in the history of business. McKinsey and BCG are battling it out, dividing the market between them. But soon there is going to be a third party emerging from the shadows. In the 1970s, the consulting world is split between two behemoths, McKinsey and BCG. But in the shadow of the giants, a fierce competitor silently prepares. The former CEO of YouTube, the former CEO of Dell, and Senator Mitt Romney all worked for them. Bain and Company. The story of Bain and Company begins with a bold move and it starts from within the ranks of BCG. In the 1970s, BCG under Bruce Henderson's leadership is pioneering new business strategies. Within its walls, two teams, the Red and Blue faction, compete fiercely against each other, pushing the bounds of innovation. Bill Bain, leader of the Blue team, is a standout with his distinctive approach to excellent client management. In a move that will reshape the consulting landscape, Bain and his blue team make a big decision. They suddenly leave BCG to establish a new competitor, Bain and Company. Their philosophy? Closer, more exclusive client relationships. This is in strong contrast to McKinsey's and BCG's more analytical approach. Bain's strategy is not just to advise from the outside, but to deeply immerse themselves in their client's business. I might be exaggerating, but it feels like for the first time in a long time, McKinsey and BCG need to provide actual value to their clients again. Bain forces McKinsey and BCG to innovate and Bain's unique approach quickly pays off. The firm begins to grow, attracting top talent and high-profile clients. But it isn't just their consulting prowess that sets them apart. They also venture into the realms of private equity and venture capital. With firms like Bain Capital, they extend their influence far beyond traditional consulting owning shares in many big corporations in the US. Today, Bain & Company's impact is evident. They've carved a unique spot in the consulting space, behind the legendary McKinsey and their predecessor, the Boston Consulting Group. Bain & Company today takes the third place in the world of strategy consulting, not to mention building one of the largest private equity funds in history. The case of how Bain came into existence is a great example of how ruthless the MBB can act. And with a company structure driven by fear and greed, it is no wonder that one day something terrible would happen. As you know, the higher you climb, the deeper you fall. When you learned this painful lesson, it might have affected your grades, relationships, or bank account. But when McKinsey had to learn it, the effects were nothing short of disastrous. In the world of business, the name McKinsey has long been synonymous with prestige and success. However, beneath the polished surface of global influence and high-profile clients, McKinsey and its competitors will face a series of scandals. One of them is so catastrophic that it will tarnish their reputation for years to come. Even though McKinsey usually keeps very private, their engagement with Purdue Pharma is so horrible that it quickly becomes infamous. Purdue Pharma is a pharmaceutical company which is now best known for one thing. Opioids are now the biggest drug epidemic in American history. Every day brings another story about the depth of this country's opioid crisis. Well, OxyContin is the powerful painkiller that was marketed aggressively by Purdue 
arguing it was not addictive. The opioid crisis that followed has killed tens of thousands a year over the last decade. Causing the opioid crisis that ravages the United States. Since its emergence, the epidemic will claim more than 750,000 American lives, making it more deadly than any other drug-induced epidemic in the history of mankind. You might have heard about the fentanyl crisis in the US. Well, OxyContin is an opioid, one of the strongest pain medications available in the world. Purdue Pharma, the producer of this opioid, is a key player in what becomes a decade shaping national health emergency. McKinsey's role in the whole thing? They advise Purdue on maximizing their sales of OxyContin to increase profits by the millions. Even amidst rising concerns about addiction and overdoses, the project's goal is to sell Oxy as fast as possible to as many people as possible, independent of the fact that some patients might not even need it. The consultancy strategists come up with aggressive marketing tactics targeting physicians known to liberally prescribe opioids. McKinsey's consultants analyzed the city's geography and pinpoint areas where people would be most likely to over-consume painkillers. Then their teams drive through neighborhoods and knock on physicians' doors to pitch and sell them on the barely tested OxyContin. This way, McKinsey essentially creates a dirty doctor whitelist and even gives out rebate for opioids-related overdoses. They effectively capitalize on the deadly addiction. Through the work of their consultants, McKinsey causes a devastating drug epidemic. These revelations emerge from a series of court documents and investigations, painting a grim picture of McKinsey's involvement in fueling the opioid crisis. The scandal rocks the consulting giant to its core. It leads to a massive public outrage and an expensive legal fallout. Until 2023, McKinsey agrees to two settlements in total, a $573 million settlement sum with 47 states in 2023 and another one of $45 million in 2021. McKinsey's deep entanglement with Purdue Pharma shows how little they care for the greater good. These firms only care about money which is fine for us megalomaniacs, but not for the rest of the world. However, the media sees things a little differently. As the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility and McKinsey has a lot of power. So when the details of this case become public, it sparks an enormous debate about the moral responsibilities of the big consulting corporations with real financial impact for these firms. This wasn't just a blip in McKinsey's already clouded history. It was a moment of introspection for the entire consulting industry. Consultancies have been taking on more and more dubious projects for years. Because why not? If they don't take the project, their competitor will. So it gets done either way. McKinsey was just the first one to get caught. In the aftermath, McKinsey has strived to rebuild trust and reform practices. They scrap offerings like the Dr. Whitelist creation and forbid their consultants to work for the pharma industry and the FDA at the same time. Although they were never officially convicted, the settlement sum of more than half a billion dollars is a admission of guilt. But the worst thing about the Purdue Pharma case? It is only the tip of the iceberg. Bain, BCG and especially McKinsey have been involved in dozens of scandals that have checkered their past. From embezzling billions of dollars from the Malaysian people, ironically used to finance the Wolf of Wall Street movie, to a prison rework gone wrong, as well as involvement in slave labor allegations. Jail officials and McKinsey consultants have reportedly jointly rigged the restart program by stacking the units with inmates they believe to be unlikely to get into fights or to attack staff in the first place. The MBB often operate far beyond the gray, and that does not only apply to their client involvements. To conduct thousands of projects a year for the world's biggest corporations and governments, the MBB need one thing more than anything else, consultants. 
especially young, hungry and exceptionally talented consultants. To get their hands on people like this, McKinsey, BCG and Bain are present in almost every major faculty at the world's top universities. They target only the top 10% of graduates across all fields of study, trying to entrap them in their malicious web with the promise of money, prestige and power. But why do so many top talents join McKinsey and Co? And why is this so dangerous for the rest of the society? For the MBB recruiters, attracting the most brilliant minds to their respective company is an art form. And points of view to build a great firm that attracts, develops, excites and retains exceptional people like you. For smart and ambitious students from the best universities, these firms present a world of opportunity. They promise rapid career advancement through frequent interactions with CEOs and fixed promotion schedules. By paying the tuition and cost of living for the most elite PhD and MBA programs, they offer unparalleled professional development opportunities, not to mention the six-figure entry-level salaries alongside hefty end-of-year bonuses. When I was working in consulting, I noticed one thing that they do very, very well. I had many colleagues that wanted to quit earlier, but we were always so close to the next promotion. It's always like the next promotion is just six months away. So you tell yourself, okay, I'll keep working and then I'll switch after that. I have friends that literally stayed in consulting for five, six, seven or more years, never really liked it, then suddenly wake up and realize they have wasted their time. Nevertheless, thousands of thousands of business school graduates fight for an entry-level job at one of the MBB every year. And more than half of the consultants are nowadays so-called exotics. These are people that work in consulting but have studied something very different. Many of them hold degrees in medicine, physics, computer science or psychology, which don't have much to do with consulting. And this exposes one great harm of the consulting profession. If these people would work in their field, they might create substantial societal value. A brilliant medical researcher working at a laboratory might one day find a cure for cancer. A gifted physicist might one day prove string theory. An ambitious programmer might one day develop the next Spotify. But if all these people are hired by the big consulting firms, They'll be spending their time building PowerPoint slides, maximizing profits for shareholders and coming up with schemes to push dangerous pharmaceuticals. No cancer cure, no string theory, no Spotify. They won't be doing what's best for society. They'll be doing what's best for their clients. This is known as the brain drain. The brightest minds from various fields are drawn away from their specialties to serve in the consulting sector. This redirection of talent has significant implications for entire industries, depriving crucial companies of the innovation, talent and expertise they so desperately need. Moreover, this brain drain even has societal impacts. When our brightest minds are stolen to solve business problems all their life, who is left to address the pressing issues in public health, climate change and education? The consulting industry's gain is, in many ways, society's loss. And there's something else that could stop some ambitious people from joining the MBB's intense work culture. Whoever has been following me for a longer time knows that for me, life is work. I do love work and that's why I work a lot. But first of all, not everyone is like that and secondly, if you divide the total salary of a consultant by the total hours worked, you will actually notice that many other professions pay much higher salaries. So why do these brilliant sought after talents stay at the consultancies? Why don't they leave? At least after a few years. Often overlooked but dangerously potent, this is the phenomenon of the golden handcuffs. A situation where consultants, despite high salaries, find themselves trapped in a cycle of continuous work, unable to leave due to the lifestyle and status they've grown accustomed to. Fast car, expensive apartment, 
tailor-made clothing. The golden handcuffs tighten as consultants become accustomed to a higher and higher standard of living. The seemingly lucrative salary bonuses and perks make it increasingly difficult to walk away, even for those who dream of a different life. Another reason is the nearly industrial fabrication of shared mindset. Within these firms, there's a paradoxical culture of individual excellence and collective identity. All consultants are pressed into becoming a specific type, analytical, poised and polished. In this process, there's a risk of losing individuality and the very diversity these firms recruiting ads claim to cherish. This pressure cooker environment also raises a question about mental health and work-life balance. The glorification of burning the midnight oil and the subtle discouragement of personal pursuits create an unsustainable lifestyle for many normies. They make it hard to find a partner, have kids, or build communities. The seductive power of prestige is evident. Young graduates eager to make their mark are drawn by the promise of a glamorous consulting career. But at what cost? So we must ask, is luring the brightest minds away with promises of wealth and status beneficial in the long run? Both for the individuals and society as a whole? The MBB's recruitment strategy, while effective so far, not only raises ethical questions, especially in the Gen Z, more and more young professionals are switching their priorities from work to private life. Four-day work week, sabbaticals and personally fulfilling pursuits like founding your own company are getting in the way of the strategies the MBB used for so many years. Thus, we must ask, are the MBB ready to change? Today, the MBB are more powerful than ever before, holding the fate of the world's largest organizations in their hands. But how will they develop beyond consulting? Are they still able to attract the top talent they need? Can they cope with the emergence of new technologies? Can and will AI replace McKinsey, BCG and Bain? The next generation of consultants, especially those from Gen Z, are reshaping the workplace. Their priorities are different. They value work-life balance, personal fulfillment and social impact more than previous generations. The traditional allure of golden handcuffs may no longer be as effective. Furthermore, the rapid advancement of technology, particularly AI, is revolutionizing industries. And it doesn't stop for consulting. It's not just a question of whether AI can replace aspects of consulting work. It's about if and how fast these firms can integrate this revolutionary technology to stay ahead. Another pressing challenge is the climate crisis. Sustainability is no longer a nice to have. It's a necessity. The MBB have the expertise and influence to lead the charge in sustainable business. But will they rise to the occasion or continue with business as usual? These examples leave only one option. The MBB need to adapt, embracing flexible work arrangements, providing avenues for meaningful impact and fostering an innovative culture that values sustainability as much as increasing profits. This puts the consulting industry at a crossroads. On one hand, the traditional model of maximizing profits and shareholder value has proven successful. On the other, there's a growing recognition that the current business model is threatened. For example, AI can pose both an opportunity and a threat. It can enhance analytical capabilities, streamline processes and offer groundbreaking insights. But it also brings the potential for job displacement and ethical quandaries. How the MBB navigate this issue in the next years will be crucial for their existence. However, it's not like the MBB are stagnant. McKinsey was the first of the three to offer unlimited sabbaticals in their new Build Your Own McKinsey program. Even a four-day work week is theoretically possible. Just recently, BCG acquired Qantas, one of the world's leading sustainability consultancies. They've even created a new internship category called visiting climate activists, emphasizing their commitment to building a powerful sustainability practice. The future of the MBB is not just about maintaining their status as industry leaders. It's about evolving in a world where technology, societal values and environmental concerns are rapidly changing the business landscape. 
the MBB have the vast resources, exceptional talent and global reach to drive significant change in our world. The question is, will they use these assets to merely sustain their old positions? Or will they redefine what it means to be a leader in the world of tomorrow? Will the MBB adapt or die? If you enjoyed this video, I'm pretty sure you will also enjoy our video about the big four and all the funny stuff that they do.